and final session of our annual symposium, Designing for Resilience. I'm Audrey Sato, your AWA Plus D president. AWA Plus D is an almost 100 year old nonprofit professional organization committed to the career advancement of women in architecture and the allied fields. I'm so proud to be here as a part of this continuing legacy and to work with you toward further change. Our tagline for the symposium, the only constant in life is change, seems ever more relevant in these trying times. Over the last five sessions, we've explored the topic of resilience from the personal perspective up to the scale of communities and cities. And we heard stories and learned a lot from a dynamic, inspiring, and accomplished set of women. If you missed any of the previous events, those sessions are up on our YouTube channel and I'll provide the link in our chat box. We're also recording tonight's session in speaker mode and we'll make that available as well. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the people who make this symposium possible. Our symposium planning committee, Meg Coffey, Sarah Garina, Alejandra Ramirez, Marisa Kurtzman, Pam Leone, and Stephanie Reich. Also, thank you to our annual sponsors, Louis Polson, Atomic Irrigation, Shimahara Visual, and Trajan Photography. And at the end of tonight's session, we will draw a winner for our symposium grand prize sweepstakes, a gorgeous necklace provided by a talented architect and AWA Plus D board member, Terry Moore. It is the Vibe Necklace by Terry's Fold Jewelry Company, and it retails at $449. So to qualify, you must have attended four or more of our six sessions and be here in person to win it. The last two sessions in the series, tonight's and last Tuesday's, are hosted by our sister organization, the Association for Women in Architecture Foundation. I would now like to introduce Ginger Tansman, AWAF president and a woman who I really look up to. Thank you, Audrey. It's mutual, actually. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about the history of AWA Foundation. And as, as you heard, we are sister organizations. But, um, and I've been a member of AWA plus D since 1973, so I, I feel like in one way I've seen it all, but not really when you consider that we're nearly 100 years old. And 23 years ago, a group of us got together and all AWA members, got, we got together and said, wouldn't it be great if we put together a charitable foundation so our donors would have a tax deduction that they don't have with the other format. And um, lo and behold, that worked. And we took on the, both the scholarships program, which, for which we made the awards last week. And then um, four years ago, I guess really five years ago now, we started to put together our long held dream of putting together a mid-career fellowship. And that is why we're here tonight and how thrilled we are. So um, we, we have put a, a lot of effort into this and and I want to thank both the AWA plus D board and the AWA Foundation board, many of whom are here on the on the line tonight, so that uh, we've got this great program together actually. I also want to thank the donors. Um, one way that the that the fellowship program has been financed over the last few years, we were the fortunate recipients, not once but twice, of a grant from the Southern California Development Forum. And um, we were really proud of ourselves and it was pretty easy to do. But you know, after a while, you have to raise the money directly. Those, those kinds of booms don't go on forever. So we're very actively raising funds at all times. And uh, just in case you want to know how to donate to the foundation, you find the link on the on the website, and um, I sure hope that link works now. <laughs> so um, I guess I should also mention that that we have been the recipients 
for the scholarship program, for example, of, of we had a very generous bequest from one of our longtime members who let, remembered us in her will. And we're still, we're, that has financed um, about, about uh, 10 years of scholarships. And so we're th thrilled at that. Those are the kinds of gifts. I, I particularly like that one because I've put AWA Foundation and, and AWA Plus D also in my will. So that's the kind of thing we are certainly very actively promoting. One more thing before I really turn it over to the program, and that is just to say that another way that we raise money is that every year, and traditionally, right up until this year, it's been save the date of the first Saturday of December. And I'd like you to save the first Saturday of December for many years to come. But not this year, because this year we're doing it all virtually. And what I'd like you to do is note that we are going to have uh, an auction of beautiful donated items as we have done for years and years. But instead of just doing it at a party, the whole period, the first 12 days of December will be a running auction. We have professional management of it. And um, I'm counting on you to come in and bid and look at the beautiful things. And I hope in fact, win some of them. So save that too. And now I would just like to turn all this to Lise Bornstein. Lise is on the AWA Foundation board, but uh, more importantly, especially now because of the season that we're in, she is the vice president, president elect. And so soon enough, she will be our president. Please. Thank you, Ginger. Um, I want to uh, welcome everybody tonight to the second of our awards events this year. And as Ginger mentioned, this is our fifth fellowship award event. Um, thank you all for coming tonight to celebrate the achievements of our colleagues, past, present, and future, inspiring us with their energy and curiosity as they investigate and expand upon our profession. In 2014 and again in 2016, we were fortunate to win two Southern California Development Forum Charity Awards, which started our fellowship program, as Ginger mentioned. As an organization, we had long wanted a way to celebrate and support professional mid-career women in architecture and allied fields in their research and exploration of design. And over the last, over these first five years, we have had tremendously strong, talented winners with a wide variety of topics that have delved into our environment, mental health, and professional legacy. Reaching this point takes a lot of effort from a lot of people over much of the year. In addition to our board, I want to give a shout out to the awards committee for all of their hard work. Jenna, and raise your hand if you're here. <laughs> Jenna Wabey uh, is our awards committee chair. Weena Dow, Kate Harvey, John V. Kanani, Issa Matia, and I want to give a special thanks to Clarissa Chung, who selects organizes and hosts our fellowship jury. Tonight we will hear from a past winner, welcome our newest fellowship recipient, and listen to our 2019 fellowship winner's presentation of her work followed by a question and answer session. And as Audrey mentioned, we will conclude with the winners of the AWA Plus D Symposium Series raffle. Um, as part of our fellowship event tonight. I've asked Audrey. She knows about this. I'm not surprising her. <laughs> I've asked Audrey Sato to share a few minutes with us. Um, Audrey was our 2017 fellowship winner. I can't believe it's been almost three years now, over three years now, um, with her project, XXLA Architects Podcast, which features interviews with inspirational women who have shaped the design and architecture landscape in Los Angeles. The podcast and website are still active today, and have expanded to include an audience, include audience members from around the world. I remember looking at the map with her, it was so cool. And <laughs> she is our current AWA plus C president and I am also honored to call her a friend, Audrey. Thank you, Lise. Um, and thank you so much to the AWAF board for provo really providing these opportunities. Um, the impact of the fellowship on my own professional development is uh, pretty incredible. And when I examine the difference um, between my life pre-fellowship and now, 
I have to say there is a very stark contrast. Uh, when I applied for the fellowship, I had already been running my own one woman practice for a while and it was a rewarding experience, but it was also very isolating. In my career, I didn't have a lot of mentors and I especially did not have access to a lot of female architects in my life who I could really model my career after or seek out for advice. So um, this was the reason why I applied for the fellowship. And uh, my goal was to seek out stories from a diverse set of women to figure out for myself um, the range of options for women practicing in architecture and also to see examples of leadership and, and really examine what success looks like. So um, the biggest impact for me is truly in the number of women who I can now personally call upon as friends, colleagues, and mentors. Um, it's in the stories that I've heard, recorded, and shared, and really related to. And a lot of these women are, are actually here tonight. Uh, for example, Ginger is one of them. And uh, I, I think it's very empowering for someone to hear a story from a person who they really ad admire and look up to, and then be able to identify similarities and pieces of, of their lives or their personality that you also see reflected in yourself. So when I started the podcast, I had thought that other m women might feel the same way as I did, but um, I really had no idea that it would reach listeners in what's now actually at least 108 countries. And um, that's so cool. It's my hope that it gives everyone, men and women, a greater understanding of what it means to be a successful architect and leader in our industry. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that I found this community. And I can only say that I wish I had found it sooner. Um, I really feel that, uh, you know, my accomplishments are, are yours as well, um, as the amount of support that I've felt from this group and benefited from uh, was not only vital to the quality of the podcast project, but also contributed to my own personal growth during these last few years. Um, I encourage everyone who can to apply and um, please support the AWAF scholarship and fellowship programs. And you know, just get involved, whether it's through sharing your story and mentoring someone in need, or volunteering with one of our groups, AWA plus D or AWAF, um, it, it makes a difference. So thank you. And um, I'll hand it over back to you. I had no idea it was 108, that's awesome. <laughs> so Audrey is our fearless leader and she's been, um, yeah. I love you kiddo. Okay, <laughs> so um, we're gonna move on to our newest award recipient. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen. We tested this beforehand. Let me do this. Apologize. Okay. Um, over the last five years, we have benefited from incredible jurors representing different facets and viewpoints in design, education, and policy. And this year is no different. Our jurors this year were Karen Compton, Kate Foley, and Jessica Reyes. Karen Compton. Karen is a principal at A3K Consulting and oversees business planning and is frequently engaged as presenter and author in practice management and issues. Katie is a landscape architect at Rios and was an adjunct faculty critic at RISD and studio instructor at Boston Architectural College. And Jessica is a graduate of the USC Seoul Price School of Public Policy and currently works at the IBI Group as an urban planner. And these jurors come together and selected Los Angeles by Color by this year's AWAF Fellowship Award recipient, Ashley Margo. Ashley, can you please um, give a shout and wave? Hello. Yay! <laughs> Los Angeles by Color promotes wider access to the city's architectural history and food culture through an emotive approach to exploration and mapping. 
Color is used as the catalyst to explore spaces in Los Angeles that are lost while driving. The project proposes the recoding of urban space examined through 160 places that vary in historical significance, economic development, and cultural function that span LA's boundaries. This project connects buildings and neighborhoods that have been historically underrepresented in literature on and LA urbanism. Viewed collectively as maps, photographs, and writings, these pieces explore and promote a reinterpreted understanding of LA's urban fabric. The jury had this to say. In addition to her strong, incredible graphics, the jury felt Ashley's research was compelling and her work explored and liberated beyond the day-to-day -day pragmatics of the workplace. They are excited for the final product and they feel that the fellowship award will contribute to the development of her work. Since we are virtual, Ashley has wave again, please. And if everybody could unmute and we could clap, share a little. Yes. I also Aww. want to say thank you so much for submitting during such a crazy time because it's not easy these days and you made it happen. And that's the theme of resilience. <laughs> um, next, and I'm going to get better at moving slides through. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our 2019 fellowship winner. Bear Ballier is a design venture co-founded by Kelly Bear and Christy Ballier and is invested in architectural research in the form of both speculative and built projects. As a design team, Bear Ballier references the current world around it, leans on a long history of precedence, and imagines what lies ahead in the form of two- and three-dimensional architectural projects. Bear Ballier's work has been exhibited internationally in the 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale and in various locations around the United States, including New York at MoMA, Los Angeles at the A&D Museum, and in Detroit at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Kelly and Christy won last year's fellowship with their project proposal, The Unstable Image, an architectural proposal that interrogates the ways in which images are destabilized through the various platforms in which we consume them. Now I would like to introduce uh, Christy Ballier. I'll begin my screen share, hopefully fluidly. <clears throat> Um, I think you guys are seeing everything. Are you guys seeing the full screen or are you seeing everything? We're seeing everything. We're seeing, yep. That is not what I would like. Um, You need to get out and go back in. Hold on. Okay. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes. No. Yes. Stop share. <laughs> Hello. I'm, uh, one moment, please. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm having to reboot the Google because it kicked me out of there. I will take no worries. The, I will take the minute of my <laughs> presentation. And, now, <laughs> and the funny thing is, everybody, we did practice, we did practice. in the half we hour did. before everything. Yep. Everything worked perfectly fine in the half hour right before the presentation. We practiced it multiple times. <laughs> But I think we've all probably had a Zoom issue at some point uh, during this pandemic. So mm -hmm. I'm just enjoying all the wonderful backgrounds that I'm seeing now. Anna, yours is fantastic. <laughs> okay. 
I'm going to take a moment while we're doing this too, and Christy, just keep going with what you need to do. Um, okay. I want to direct everybody to uh, just to think about, I'm going to put shameless, shameless, shameless plug in for our donations. Um, we have posted on the chat a link to how you can donate um, at any time during the year. As Ginger mentioned, we have our donations uh, specifically um, uh, at our holiday party, which is our holiday auction this year. But uh, the link and donate button is open all the time. Okay, I will um, try now. Share screen one. Okay, does that work now or no? You're still seeing everything. You know, everything. I don't. Yeah. Can you do it on presenter mode down on the bottom right? Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what we tested it on um, before. View, like if I do present mode here, start presentation. All right, that's closer. Yeah, great. All right, I will not be switching. I out. think that's good. There we go. Yeah. I appreciate your patience. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was not planned as part of the unstable image um, beginning. Um, but I'd like to first start by uh, saying congratulations to Ashley. Um, this is a, a wonderful community um, that I was uh, very lucky to have come upon last year when a what a female mentor of mine um, encouraged uh, Kelly and I to apply. Um, so I definitely would like to thank AWAF, um, please. I remember getting that call last year and it was really exciting. It's a line of research that we were just starting um, and have gotten some support um, since then, but you guys were the first and everyone knows how that first line of support is um, what helps get things going. Um, I'd also like to thank Audrey, who I've been able to meet a few times uh, throughout the year. I was also able to um, kind of meet uh, Christina Monte once uh, for lunch um, for a kind of an office mentoring session. Um, and thank you, Dana, I think for our Q&A later, hopefully, as long as I didn't consume that by my juggle in the beginning. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for their support. Um, and the opportunity, like I said, to meet so many of you last year and throughout the year. The topics that you've been discussing in the past weeks, professional curiosity and resilience, are so important at this time. I'd also say that it's very important at this time that we support each other. And speaking of that, um, tonight I am presenting on behalf of my partner, uh, Kelly Bear and I. Together, we make up Bear Ballier. Um, we are solidly mid-career. Um, we straddle uh, teaching, uh, both of us, and we have a small design practice together that is based in downtown Los Angeles and Oak Park, Chicago. Um, we have been practicing remote for over five years. Um, I can't say it has completely prepared us for this season. I like how you said that, Virginia, um, but it has prepared us a little bit. Everything we do is mediated day in and day out is mediated and day in and day out we're women supporting women both in school and in practice. Um, to start here is an image um, that splices our two worlds together uh, Los Angeles and Chicago. It was the image we submitted for our proposal last year and represents the beginning of this line of research within the office. The research is titled the unstable image and this was before COVID. Architecture has always set the stage for the construction of our collective histories. While typically forefronted in disciplinary context, it often serves as the backdrop for cultural, social, and political events. In today's mediated world, these conventional positions between foreground, middle ground, and background are challenged as we consume information primarily through two-dimensional images of three-dimensional spaces and events. In terms of output and impact of this support, I think a big component of this presentation tonight, 
The research component of this project started immediately last summer. It allowed us to spend time on the, in the office and build um, and fabricate several models. The impact in the, of, in the office continues, but tonight I will share a few of the spin-offs so far and hint, hint at the ones to come. The first phase of the research um, that we were able to prepare um, was selected and included as a paper for this year's ACSA 108th Annual Conference and Proceedings and was, in, and was also included and adapted in an adapted format in an article in the UIC journal Fresh Meat with the topic Architecture in the Age of Digital Image Sharing. We also used the beginning of the research to develop a speculative design project, the House of Cores. It received a director's choice in the house competition um, that was announced last autumn in 2019 in the practical category. I don't know if most of you know our work, but we don't usually um, get recognition in that type of category as most of our work um, straddles academia and speculative work. So in the final output phase of the research will culminate in an exhibition titled No More Room. This was commissioned for the SciArt Gallery and it was scheduled to be built within the gallery this past June. If we were hosting this symposium in SciArt, the hope would have been that we may have been able to visit it together. Um, but it has been rescheduled for March of 2021. Um, so it is likely that the unstable nature of this project will work to accommodate a hybrid, in a hybrid of a physical and virtual exhibition that we are currently working on with the school right now to be the first exhibition that would happen um, in that format. So I will um, kind of split the presentation in those three categories. I will start by reviewing um, the paper um, that we presented and which is the kind of underpinning research um, that was supported uh, here. One second. Oh, did I fall out of the presenter mode? Yes. That's a shame. Oh, so why did that happen again? Hmm. Does anyone know why that happens whenever I toggle between? Hmm. They might have to see it like this. I'm not sure how to get out of that each time. I don't know why when I'm toggling between the two that it's um, Oh, here we go. There we go. Um, so the unstable, the unstable image is the, the paper that I will, will be the first part of the presentation. According to um, a 2018 Microsoft study, the attention span of human beings shrunk from 12 seconds in 2000, the approximate start of the digital turn, to eight seconds. If we now have a lower attention span than a goldfish, then how is architecture, a discipline that literally casts in place physical materials with mortar, silicone, and welds to capture the attention of its subjects when other visual information is changing around us at gigabyte speeds? While our attention may be waning, our ability to multitask has increased as our lives become increasingly digitized. This Darwinian adaptation of our brains and subsequently our eyes to multiple image screens, clearly mine are still adapting to the two I'm trying to work right now, suggest opportunities to expand architectural cultural role. The Unstable Image Project interrogates contemporary ways in which images are destabilized through the various image platforms in which we consume them, social media, news, outlets, etc. It explores the spatial constructs that are lurking within the plethora of two-dimensional images that we engage daily in rapid succession. Multi-screening, swiping, scrolling increases the quantity and impact the images we consume. 
resulting in new media. We swipe in all directions in our haste to see the next image. Blips occur. Sometimes these brief images, uh, <clears throat> sometimes these brief irregularities merge two discrete photos into a singular split screen image. Instagram stalling out between story transitions is one example of this, where images from two different events and authors are placed in a spatial dialogue with one another. These <clears throat> temporary encounters um, in unstable images that are composited and hybridized three-dimensionally. <clears throat> the unstable image analyzes and intentionally hacks these destabilized images towards the production of spatial constructions that reference the digital platforms through proposing alternative scenarios for architecture in the physical world. Beatrice Colomina claims that the idea of a single image that commands our attention has faded away, stating that it seems as if we need to be distracted in order to concentrate. Positing that it is this state of distraction, in this state of distraction, we've in, in fact produced a new form of attention. Colomina goes on to describe the Eames's exhibition for the 1959 Moscow World's Fair involving an array of 70 20 foot by 30 foot screens suspended within a Bucky Fuller geodesic dome, upon which their film Glimpses of the USA was projected onto. The film, a collection of thousands of images from multiple sources, was not projected simply for information or entertainment purposes, but rather to produce a space within a space. While one might while one might gather the use of multiple screens in Eames's work, film and architecture alike, stems from prevalent military and surveillance videos of the times, their effects went beyond perceptual views towards the destabilization of the linear experience of architectural space. The split screen traditionally uses a cinematic and television technique, specifically challenging one's understanding of space, time and perception by constructing framed views of multiple scenes simultaneously. According to Multi Hagener, the split screen foregrounds the artificial nature of the image. A frame within a frame draws attention to the act of framing itself by visibly displaying the basic principles that forms the condition of possibility for the image. The frame that draws a distinction between inside and outside, between image and non-image. The unstable image looks specifically um, at the blip of Instagram story transitions and the temporary stall between two unrelated images. In this contemporary moment of distraction, the core, an interior point of shared origin, focuses on the stable center and the zones of maximum spatial interchange. Core samples extracted from existing canonical uh, vernacular homes, which I will show you in a minute, are molded, are modeled and rendered at oblique camera angles to establish a split screen image and spliced together in four ways. This is what is being shown here. First, renderings of the core models are posited in sequence within Instagram story interface. As stories cycle through, the uploaded images are three-dimensionalized onto two adjacent surfaces, producing an illusion of a cubic massing. Next, interior renderings are produced, <clears throat> are projected to non-primitive shapes developed from the volume within the rendering. Do I need to pick one more? Okay. Um, simulating the story transition with a nuanced host form. Okay. Um, and third, Third, interior renderings are three-dimensionally mapped onto surfaces that thicken and layer in the form of alter alternative inner cores and inverted facades. Lastly, the renderings are developed through green screens that result in an animated short film. The films reframe and extend the single objective lens of the original static 
image. The second instance of the project literalizes the core samples and organizes them as movable wall partitions intended to be experienced <clears throat> in the round and without fixed viewpoints. The resultant spaces offer unique the resultant spaces offer unique possibilities for architectural elements by resyncing typical linear enclosures, such as the extruded wall or the suspended ceiling. No longer limited by fixed locations in space or prescriptive relationships between elements in the core, the cores migrate around and between each other, producing spaces to both view and inhabit. In conclusion, the unstable image expands the depths of reality that stem from our image saturated world as opposed to flattening it. It, shakes, it stakes a claim on the image's potential to produce spatial propositions in an age of ubiquitous image making. If contemporary modes of operation are to either post as an upload work designed specifically for a particular image sharing platform, or to build work in the physical world that is literally an image, the unstable image offers an alternative to the image problem by spatially materializing nonlinear image matter into subjective architectural experiences for physical and virtual audiences alike. So that was, even as I'm reading it, maybe a bit dense. My second half of this is going to kind of unpack that, I think, with a few more visuals to kind of um, show how that has turned into um, some base for how we worked on the house project and then also how it might become part of the um, upcoming exhibition. Um, let me just make one final switch. Great. Um, so as we often do in the office, last summer when we were working on the unstable research project that I just shared, hopefully not too, um, not too uh, lengthy, um, we created an intentional shift or a juggle in a parallel project, the cores of houses became the focus. The shift corresponded with our desire to rethink the home. To start working on a home, we started by looking at what holds it together, the core. The core of a house migrates, sometimes located at the geometric center and other times assigned based on value or a role, such as a hearth, a stair, or a courtyard. And of course, there is a double meaning. A core sample in both geological and architectural terms maps time and spatial layers. So we dove into the house. 22 core samples were extracted from houses between 1750 and 2009, spanning the compartmentalized foursquare to the open plan. You may recognize some of these. And in many ways, we see what we are showing today as a collective project of how we think in the office, research migrating across multiple platforms. However, the house of cores shakes out this research and lands on the ground and imagines occupation. The mixture of cores and houses led us to review a few projects that were strong in their concept and representation of execution of what we were starting to call cores. So for example, the 2468 house by Morphosis in 1978 is a house as core, or the Orinda house by Charles Moore in 1962 perhaps captured cores, and the withdrawing room by Diller and Scofidia in 1987, split cores. The house of cores is situated as we saw it in a semi-urban neighborhood surrounded by traditional Southern California bungalows. The house um, encourages multiple scenarios for domestic living, working, renting, owning, present, future, and challenges the longstanding notion of mine and yours by fostering core migration, both within the single lot as well as across it.
in society's constant search for perfection, I don't know if anyone remembers that game as a child, a range of social and political and cultural forces points to a history of addition and subtraction for the house typology with core both internal and expelled. Today, the ability to accommodate and purge offers multiple options for redefining how one or many live. And now for a quick tour. Interrogating cores, the literal and conceptual point that hold the house together allows one to pull it apart spatially, formally, materially, and programmatically. Here you see a scenario where they begin to settle into a neighborhood. The house of cores plays with multiples. The quantity allows the legibility of parts to flicker. The parts swivel and rest. The cores are unstable, a series of partial forms that migrate around the ring, challenging terms of ownership. And if we were gonna read this um, in a real estate write-up, we would maybe say that this house is a two-level bedroom, is a two-level, three-bedroom, two-bath house with an indoor-outdoor living room, one and a half kitchens, and a garage. Ah. Or we could say it's four partial unstable cores that are splitting living with life. <clears throat> you can start to see how that works out in some of the plans. And in terms of our representation, here you can see what we were calling the rendering of a split screen. We call this the large core, which includes, a co the large core includes sleeping, bathing, and lounging. The medium core, that is a partial ADU with a separate, a separate entry. <clears throat> a small core with dining with an office on top. <clears throat> and an adjacent courtyard to begin to spread out. And finally, there's an, there's an extra small core uh, for exercising with its accomplice, the ring, a spatial link that produces a porous boundary between the cores and the site. And the final part of the presentation is a preview to um, the no more rooms, which will hopefully be, um, well, Actually, I'll stay on script. Um, the last project is a whip, as we all would say. But even in nowadays, we could call it a whip that it's been for quite some time, or we could say it's pending to be discussed within the COVID factor of when and maybe and what if, um, and that we're doing a lot of shifting and waiting for this upcoming exhibition in the gallery that is now hopefully being considered for March 2021 to June 2021, so maybe it'll be up for the symposium next year. The project begins with a heavy, the project begins with a heavy design hand. One-to-one -one core samples are designed using the relationships and qualities that we found in that earlier core work. Elements such as stairs, ramps, walls, floors, ceilings, soffits, these cores will were all incorporated into these series of designs. The cores will engage the ground with rounded bottoms and figural tops that challenge extrusion. The combinatory effect of the emergent cores are less about abstraction and more about intensification. They project an architecture of partiality, yet attempt to dial up the material and spatial qualities to 11. The new cores are designed to fill the gallery, not by occupying the center, but rather by multiplying the centers. The cores are immersive within the gallery and create a skyline from the mezzanine level. This is a model of the gallery with some of the core um, models um, inside. And each core includes four incomplete rooms. This somewhat crude fabrication diagram is not for construction at this point, but rather illustrates the range of possible fabrication techniques that will be utilized. We anticipate using traditional stick frame construction interlaced with more nuanced building methods. And unrolled drawings, finally, reveal the four parts of each core within the same pictorial plane. 
offering a pre-visualization of anticipated effects of the built installation. These drawings illustrate how each partial room negotiates the ground, inside and outside corners, and thresholds. They reference and amplify the split screen qualities that we encounter in our daily lives. The drawings are both section and elevation at the same time. The drawings would have been printed large scale within the gallery, contributing to the immersive environment, but now may be part of an augmented app that we are designing. Um, when arranged as multiples, their scalloped edges produce a fish-eyed lens pro projection effect when viewed from eye level, amplifying effect effects through consolidation, a potential antidote to the scarcity of means that often come with design exhibitions, even with support from you. Um, and in to close, the core issues we've presented are no doubt an expansion of our project's ethos, a pursuit towards an architecture that is both and, flat and full, interior and exterior, one and many, and one that possesses the capacity for space to project multiple subjectivities and to certainly be a bit unstable at times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move straight to Q&A. Um, Jenna has been collecting questions. I see I've been seeing some questions kind of come up as uh, we you finished up. So I'm going to move to Jenna, the committee chair. Thank you, Lise. And thank you so much, Christy. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in through the chat. So if any of the rest of you had questions, please be sure to post them there and, and we'll ask them for you. So um, the first question from Stephanie Reich is in regards to the House of Cores project that you're presenting, Christy. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the geometry that you chose for the project? Was it the idea of core samples? Perhaps if the geometry was different, such as the partial EU, can more easily work with traditional lots. Yeah, um, I was just going to put, I was asked, I'll put my website in the chat. Um, it will be related to my answer a little bit. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Um, I think the answer is twofold. Um, first, maybe the, the, more, the more straightforward one is that my partner and I love uh, circles and curvature and are often trying to kind of work with uh, kind of misfits. So we kind of enjoy uh, the way that um, circles, curves um, interact with often the kind of orthogonal um, qualities of the world around us. You can see that in a lot of our other in a lot of our other work. I think here, though, in this case, and maybe we're always just looking for alibis, but I think the uh, core sample, um, you know, had multiple meetings, and I hope that didn't feel too much like whiplash. Um, but you know, the core samples. Um, the, with the geological reference of actually sort of taking a core sample from the ground and kind of pulling that up and examining that, um, certainly in that case is more of a cylindrical, a uh, cylindrical form. Um, so I think that's that's probably the second part. And I think the third part was as we were trying to kind of move the unstable image, this idea of something that kind of flickers and is kind of always incomplete at yet always full. Um, we were thinking forward to the gallery show um, and we thought that, that the unstable in terms of a flickering of imagery could also could translate formally to this kind of cylinder that would maybe have like a rounded bottom. So something that was a little bit like more like a weeble wobble if you can, I don't know, so many, so many playful references today, but um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I do think the, the ADU, um, it does square off at certain points, but yes, it's true. Um, the kind of uh, ADU would probably have um, kind of an odd geometry, but maybe that would just be used uh, for a garden or a walkway or a courtyard that would negotiate the perimeter of the site and the perimeter of the house. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. I think there's a lot of interest in this idea around 
the core. And so um, both Sarah and Alicia asked some questions that I'll combine. So I'm wondering if you have a way that you like to add priority to different cores. And then also wondering if there's any kind of a grammatical relationship among the cores. Hmm, it's, it, those are good questions. Again, um, maybe our, our website might give a little more context. I feel like because, um, I, I feel like I'm kind of, we're still working through it that maybe we don't have like all of the, um, all of the evidence that would, that would kind of break it down. But we do, I like that, that question because we do often like to think of our work having like a, like a DNA and we often make um, afterwards kind of a DNA type of diagram um, that sort of shows how um, form, formal decisions might be um, connected. Um, even if I think we work really hard, that those are things that you wouldn't recognize initially when you look at the work. Like you wouldn't, it's more like cousins than um, siblings, I think is how we often like to think of um, the forms that we're, that we're creating. Um, and I guess that's maybe also related to the priorities um, that we're, I think we're often trying to subvert um, at least visual, um, visual priority. So sometimes maybe the one that is larger um, would have less articulation and maybe the one that's smaller and in this case more stout um, might have more of a figured top or something so that um, they're kind of flickering among them. their qualities that make them noticeable um, as opposed to one of the cores um, having more detail and or being larger, et cetera. I don't know if that answers the question. I, thinking back, I'm like, maybe I should have just shown one of these three um, trajectories. It feels like it's a lot, but. All right, um, trying to sort through some of these questions. We're, we're getting a lot in. So um, I'm going to read one from Audrey. She's, she's referencing back to one of your other projects that you didn't present tonight. So um, she says, it seems like the idea of a geological core sample also relates to your earlier project where you were using industrial tubes as architectural lines. Can you talk about whether your work is inspired by these sort of overlooked, maybe somewhat mundane or utilitarian sources? Audrey, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, Again, I mean, I, I hopefully, hopefully I had some cohesion in the presentation that the, that um, not because of your question, but just because of my response that when we first um, were asked to do the gallery show, which is why we started to develop uh, new research, everyone thought that we were going to put those pipes. So um, a, a proposal that we had um, prepared and lost for the MoMA PS1 um, project. Um, everyone thought we would build that project in the gallery. And so there was, it was definitely like in our minds, these large, large pipes um, that we had just worked on. And so I think we were maybe thinking of like, that, that might've been something we were thinking of in terms of these core samples sitting as an artifact in the gallery would look like, could be read as kind of large lines that have articulation along them, which is what we were so fascinated by when we were using um, the HDPE like corrugated pipe that everyone sees along the highway, right? Like these things, they're so incredibly articulated. The shadows that they cast are so beautiful. I mean, they're often underground, but when you expose them, you, they have a tremendous amount of articulation. Um, even though like in their singular gesture, it's a line. And so um, it definitely was in our thought to that project was had, we had just kind of completed it, but we didn't want to build it again. Like we didn't want to um, kind of do that. And so I think that this was our way to maybe step a little closer um, back into kind of architecture, um, but also maybe think about at the end of the day, we were going to build four big lines in that gallery. <laughs> Christine, thank you so much. Um, we actually have more questions, but we're running out of time sure. and we want to be really um, uh, sensitive to everybody's time, but there are more questions. So I'm going to say encourage 
um, people to contact Christy here. I go, I'm just going to throw email your way or go to your yeah, website, yeah. get an email, um, to follow up any questions that you have for Christy. And, um, it's clear that you're super passionate about your, um, exploration and your passions and your curiosity. And we thank you for being an award winner and sharing yeah. your, um, the results of your year with us. And with yeah. that, thank I'm you. going to turn. So thank you. Actually, sorry. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clap <your hands>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And again, um, <laughs> thank you for, for bearing with me with the, the unstable image between monitors. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, with that, I'm going to pass to Sarah uh, for the results. The results, yes, um, if you've been to many of these, which uh, it turns out a lot of you have been to many of these, um, we do a drawing at the end of the presentation and I get the um, privilege of announcing the name. Um, in this case, this is our grand finale drawing. Uh, Audrey spoke about it at the beginning, but I'll just touch on this quickly. Um, this, is the, this is the grand dame of all of the drawings. It's a, a beautiful necklace that has been donated to us by um, a former AWAD president, um, Terry Moore. She has an architectural practice, practice and a jewelry line. And this is this gorgeous um, necklace from Fold Jewelry. Uh, and we were saying, because it's so special, we said you had to attend at least four events um, in order to win this. And you had to be here. And so we actually have um, 12 people who qualify. Uh, these people couldn't have been board members or involved with this symposium. Sorry, ladies, you, you knew that. But um, so, uh, so besides the, all of us who are involved, there's still um, that many people interested or here uh, that have been here for four, more than four events of our six part series. Thank you everybody for coming. This has been a wonderful symposium and truly an amazing um, feat in a time when you know, we weren't going to be able to pull this off in person and this is our main event and it's just so nice that everybody's here and has been able to attend so many parts of our six part series so thank you um and so without further ado i'd like to announce that amanda barnes is our big winner amanda i think you're here i know you're here i saw your name that's why you've been called amanda she's here somewhere Yay. Yay. <laughs> she might not, want to, <laughs> might not want to be um, visible. I don't know. But um, anyway, she's here and we're um, really excited that you get to wear this necklace to all the AWA plus D and AWAF events in your future. So. I'm here. But... <laughs> Hi. Yes. So I'll, I'll get in touch with you later. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're so sweet. And great. Congratulations, everyone. And great job, ladies, for putting this together. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So I'd like to just do a final round of applause for everybody. Thank you yeah, very thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, and have a great night. OK, thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Good job, Christy. Thank you. Thank you.